The Count and the Wedding Guest by O. Henry. One evening when Andy Donovan went to dinner at his Second Avenue boarding house, Mrs. Scott introduced him to a new boarder, a young lady, Miss Conway. Miss Conway was small and unobtrusive. She wore a plain snuffy brown dress and bestowed her interest which seemed languid upon her plate. She lifted her diffident eyelids and shot one perspicuous judicial glance at Mr. Donovan, politely murmured his name, and returned to her mutton. Mr. Donovan bowed with the grace and beaming smile that were rapidly winning for him social, business, and political advancement, and erased the snuffy brown one from the tablets of his consideration. Two weeks later, Andy was sitting on the front steps enjoying his cigar. There was a soft rustle above and behind him, and Andy turned his head, and had his head turned. Just coming out of the door was Miss Conway. She wore a night black dress of crepe de, crepe de, oh, the, the thin black goods. Her hat was black and from it drooped and fluttered an ebon veil, filmy as a spider's web. She stood on the top step and drew on black silk gloves. Not a speck of white or a spot of color about her dress anywhere. Her rich golden hair was drawn with scarcely a ripple into a shining smooth knot low on her neck. Her face was plain rather than pretty, but it was now illuminated and made almost beautiful by her large gray eyes that gazed above the houses across the street into the sky with an expression of the most appealing sadness and melancholy. Gather the idea, girls. All black, you know, with the preference for crepe de... Oh, crepe de shame, that's it. All black and that sad, faraway look and the hair shining under the black veil. You have to be a blonde, of course. And try to look as if though your young life had been blighted just as it was about to give a hop, skip, and a jump over the threshold of life. A walk in the park might do you good, and be sure to happen out the door at the right moment. And oh, it'll fetch them every time. But it's fierce now. How cynical I am, ain't it, to talk about morning costumes this way. Mr. Donovan suddenly reinscribed Miss Conway upon the tablets of his consideration. He threw away the remaining inch and a quarter of his cigar that would have been good for an eight minutes yet and quickly shifted his center of gravity to his low-cut patent leathers. Well, it's a fine, clear evening, Miss Conway, he said. And if the Weather Bureau could have heard the confident emphasis of his tones, it would have hoisted the square right signal and nailed it to the mast. Well, to them that has the heart to enjoy it, it is, Mr. Donovan, said Miss Conway with a sigh. Mr. Donovan, in his heart, cursed fair weather. Heartless weather. It should hail and blow and snow to be consonant with the mood of Miss Conway. I hope none of your relatives... I hope you haven't sustained a loss, ventured Mr. Donovan. Death has claimed, said Miss Conway, hesitating, not a relative, but one who... Oh, but I won't intrude my grief upon you, Mr. Donovan. Intrude, protested Mr. Donovan. Why, well, say, Miss Conway, I'd be delighted. I mean, I'd be sorry. I mean, well, I'm sure nobody could sympathize with you truer than I would. Well, Miss Conway smiled a little smile, and oh, it was sadder than her expression in repose. Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep, and they give you the laugh, she quoted. I've learned that, Mr. Donovan. I have no friends or acquaintances in this city. But you've been kind to me. I appreciate it highly. Well, he'd passed her the pepper twice at the table. It's tough to be alone in New York. That's a cinch, said Mr. Donovan. But say, whenever this little old town does loosen up and get friendly, it goes the limit. Say you took a little stroll in the park, Miss Conway. Don't you think it might chase away some of your mully grubs? And if you'd allow me... Well, thanks, Mr. Donovan. I'd be pleased to accept of your escort if you think the company of one whose heart is filled with gloom could be anyways agreeable to you. Through the open gates of the iron-railed old downtown park, where the elect once took the air, they strolled and found a quiet bench. There is this difference between the grief of youth and that of old age. Youth's burden is lightened by as much of it as another shares. Old age may give and give, but the sorrow remains the same. He was my fiancé, confided Miss Conway at the end of an hour. We were going to be married next spring. I don't want you to think that I'm stringing you, Mr. Donovan, but he was a real count. He had an estate and a castle in Italy. Count Fernando Mazzini was his name. I never saw the beat of him for elegance. Well, Papa objected, of course, and once we eloped, but Papa overtook us and took us back. I thought sure Papa and Fernando would fight a duel. Papa has a livery business, in Poughkeepsie, you know. Well, finally, Papa came round all right and said we might be married next spring. Fernando showed him proofs of his title and wealth, 
and then we went over to Italy to get the castle fixed up for us. So Pop is very proud, and when Fernando wanted to give me several thousand dollars for my trousseau, he called him down, something awful. He wouldn't even let me take a ring or any presents from him. And when Fernando sailed, I came to the city and got a position as a cashier in a candy store. Well, three days ago, I got a letter from Italy, forwarded from Poughkeepsie, saying that Fernando had been killed in a gondola accident. Well, that is why I'm in mourning. My heart, Mr. Donovan, will remain forever in his grave. I guess I'm poor company, Mr. Donovan, but I cannot take any interest in no one. I should not care to keep you from your gaiety and your friends who can smile and entertain you. Perhaps you would prefer to walk back to the house. Now, girls, if you want to observe a young man hustle out after a pick and shovel, just tell them that your heart is in some other fellow's grave. Young men are grave robbers by nature. Ask any widow. Something must be done to restore that missing organ to weeping angels and crepe to shame. Dead men certainly get the worst of it from all sides. Oh, I'm awfully sorry, said Mr. Donovan gently. No, we won't walk back to the house just yet. And don't say you haven't no friends in this city, Miss Conway. I'm awfully sorry, and I, I want you to believe that I'm your friend. And I'm awful sorry. I've got his picture here in my locket, said Miss Conway, after wiping her eyes with her handkerchief. I never showed it to anybody, but I will to you, Mr. Donovan, because I believe you to be a true friend. Mr. Donovan gazed long and with much interest at the photograph in the locket that Miss Conway opened for him. The face of Count Mazzini was one to command interest. It was a smooth, intelligent, bright, and almost handsome face, the face of a strong, cheerful man who might well be a leader among his fellows. I have a larger one framed in my room, said Miss Conway. When we return, I will show you that. They are all I have to remind me of Fernando, but he will ever be present in my heart. That's a sure thing. A subtle task confronted Mr. Donovan, that of supplanting the unfortunate count in the heart of Miss Conway. This his admiration for her determined him to do. But the magnitude of the undertaking did not seem to weigh upon his spirits. The sympathetic but cheerful friend was the role he essayed, and he played it so successfully that the next half hour found them conversing pensively across two plates of ice cream, though yet there was no diminution of the sadness in Miss Conway's large gray eyes. Before they parted in the hall that evening, she ran upstairs and brought down the framed photograph, wrapped lovingly in a white silk scarf. Mr. Donovan surveyed it with inscrutable eyes. He gave me this the night he left for Italy, said Miss Conway. I had the one for the locket made from this. Well, fine-looking man, said Mr. Donovan heartily. How would it suit you, Miss Conway, to give me the pleasure of your company to Coney next Sunday afternoon? Well, a month later, they announced their engagement to Mrs. Scott and the other boarders. Miss Conway continued to wear black. A week after the announcement, the two sat on the same bench in the downtown park while fluttering leaves of the trees made a dim kinetoscope picture of them in the moonlight. But Donovan had worn a look of abstracted gloom all day. He was so silent tonight that Love's lips could not keep back any longer the questions that Love's heart propounded. Well, what's the matter, Andy? You're so solemn and grouchy tonight. It's nothing, Maggie. I know better, can't I tell? You've never acted this way before. What is it? It's nothing much, Maggie. Yes, it is, and I want to know. I'll bet it's some other girl you're thinking about. All right, why don't you go get her if you want her? Take your arm away, if you please. Well, I'll tell you then, said Andy wisely. But I guess you won't understand it exactly. You've heard of Mike Sullivan, haven't you? Big Mike Sullivan, everybody calls him. Well, no, I haven't, said Maggie. And I don't want to if he makes you act like this. Who is he? Oh, he's the biggest man in New York, said Andy almost reverently. He can do about do anything he wants to with Tammany or any other old thing in the political line. He's a mile high and as broad as East River. You say anything against Big Mike and you'll have a million men on your collarbone in about two seconds. Well, he made a visit over to the old country a while back, and the kings took to their holes like rabbits. Well, Big Mike's a friend of mine. I ain't more than a deuce high in the district as far as influence goes, but... Well, Mike's as good of a friend to a little man or a poor man as he is to a big one. I met him today on the Bowery, and what do you think he does? He comes up and shakes hands. Andy, says he, I've been keeping cases on you. You've been putting in some good licks over on your side of the street, and I'm proud of you. What do you take to drink? He takes a cigar, and I take a highball. Well, I told him I was going to get married in two weeks. Well, Andy, says he, send me an invitation so I'll keep in mind of it, and I'll come to the wedding. Well, that's what Big Mike says to me, and he always does what he says. Well, you don't understand it, Maggie, but I'd have one of my hands cut off to have Big Mike Sullivan at our wedding. It'd be the proudest day of my life. 
When he goes to a man's wedding, there's a guy being married that's made for life. Now, that's why I'm maybe looking sore tonight. Well, why don't you invite him then if he's so much to the mustard, said Maggie lightly. Well, there's a reason why I can't, said Andy sadly. There's a reason why he mustn't be there. Don't ask me what it is, for I can't tell you. Oh, I don't care, said Maggie. It's something about politics, of course, but it's no reason why you can't smile at me. Maggie, said Andy presently, do you think as much of me as you did your, well, as, as you did of the Count Mazzini? He waited a long time, but Maggie did not reply. And then suddenly she leaned against his shoulder and began to cry. To cry and shake with sobs, holding his arm tightly and wetting the crepe de chaine with tears. There, 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 soothed Andy, putting aside his own trouble. What is it now? Andy, sobbed Maggie, I've lied to you and you'll never marry me or love me anymore. But I feel I've got to tell. Andy, there's never so much a little finger of account. I've never had a bow in my life. But all the other girls had, and they talked about him, and that seemed to make the fellows like them more. And Andy, I look swell and black. You know I do. So I went out to a photograph store and bought that picture, and had a little one made for my locket, and made up all that story about the count and about his being killed so I could wear black. And nobody can love a liar, and you'll shake me, Andy, and I'll, I'll die for shame. Oh, there never was anybody I liked but you, and, well, that's all. But instead of being pushed away, she found Andy's arm folding her closer. She looked up and saw his face cleared and smiling. Could you, could you forgive me, Andy? Well, sure, said Andy. It's all right about that. Back to the cemetery for the count. You've straightened everything out, Maggie. I was in hopes you would before the wedding day. Bully girl. Well, Andy, said Maggie, with a somewhat shy smile, after she'd been thoroughly assured of forgiveness. Did you believe all that story about the count? Well... Not to any large extent, said Andy, reaching for his cigar case. Because it's Big Mike Sullivan's picture you got in that locket of yours.